Our call to worship today is from Isaiah 64, verse 4 through 9. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you, who acts for those who wait for him. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember your, you in your ways. Behold, you are angry, and we sin. In our sins we have been a long time. And shall we be saved? We have all become like the one who is unclean, and all the righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like the leaf, and our iniquities like the wind will take us away. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us, and you have made us melt in the hands of iniquity. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father, and we are the clay. You are the potter, and we are the work of your hand. Last verse, but be not so terribly angry, O oh Lord, and remember not our iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are your people. Let's pray. God, thank you. Help us to remember, despite our iniquity and our brokenness, our sin, that you love us in Christ, that you know us, and you work righteousness. Help us to be joyful. Help us to sing loudly and joyfully, knowing that when we are in Christ, we are a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things are coming. Be with us as we worship you. May we worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's sing. Please stand with us and sing.
read from Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 15. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming the, and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven spirits had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their means. And when a crowd was gathered, and people from town after town had came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and, he, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into the good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And he, as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when the disciples asked him what the parable meant, he said to to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables. So they see and so seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this the seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but, the, but these have no root, and they believe for a little while, and in time of testing fall away. And as for the ones fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches of the, and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. And, it, and for that, in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, ladies, for singing. Uh, it's interesting that passage it says, to you, it's been given, but these outside has not been given. Some people kind of get all wonky about that. But it's interesting because we're the ones reading that, and it's actually both sides are given, right? <laughs> both the parable and the explanation of the parable. So the context there always matters. And that's, as one of my old pastors would say, context is king. That what is being talked about at that moment is talking to those people at that particular time. So a little note for that, if that uh, made you head your, scratch your head or something. We're going to be in Acts, that of course was from the Gospel of Luke. Luke wrote Luke and Acts, Volume 1, Volume 2, and we are going to be finishing Chapter 10. And as you turn there, I want you to think for something that you thought you'd never do, or maybe say something you never thought you'd have to say, or maybe even eat something you never thought you'd eat. Right? We could probably all answer yes to at least one or maybe all three of those things. And if that's the case, you can relate much to the Apostle Peter as he did all these things and more because he was very much a Jew. He was very much a fisherman. He was very much a brutish guy, very passionate. Uh, not brutish in a bad way per se, but you know, we know his story and denying Christ and it's never going to happen and Jesus says, let me wash your feet. And he says, never. He said, well, if you don't let me wash your feet, then, hey, you don't have no part of me. And he says, okay, wash everything. You know, it's, just, it's not just, okay, you can wash my feet, but everything, wash my whole body. You know, Peter's a passionate guy. Um, he's up there with the inner three with James, his brother, and also John, who's the apostle uh, as well, who wrote Revelation, the gospel, and of course the letters, first, second, and third, John. So Peter's close, right? And this whole thing in the first 10 chapters by and large, is discussing Peter and him being this pinnacle point as the chief apostle that was appointed by Christ. He never thought he would be preaching to non-Jewish people, likely. 
Right? I never thought that he would see a vision, as we see in earlier chapter 10, of the sheet. Remember, he's hungry, he's up on, you know, it's midday, it's summertime, nice and breezy by the Mediterranean, and he gets hungry because it's noon. And he falls into a trance, which is kind of like a vision, but kind of like reality. And there's this, this sheet that comes down, and there's animals. You know, and of course, the best animal of all time, the pig, and he's there. And, you know, you got bacon and ham and everything else. And he says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he says, I've never done that, Lord. What are you talking about? And he says, don't call what is common, that what God has blessed, common and unclean. So likely he had bacon for lunch, maybe a BLT. No, I don't know. Probably not. But anyway, the point is, that's not about food. It's actually not about eating animals, though we are now allowed to do that. We'll look more on that in a moment. But if you wouldn't mind standing in honor of the Lord's Word, I'm going to read Acts 10.24 through 48, and we'll pray and get into our text. Verse 24, on the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and called together his relatives and close friends. And when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And Peter lifted, up his, lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man like you. And as he walked with him, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone from another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So I was sent for, and I came without objection. Now I ask you, why did you send for me? Verse 30, Now Cornelius said four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa, and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner, who is by the sea. And I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. And therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have commanded, been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth. Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And in the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning with Galilee, from Galilee, after the baptism of John, and how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did in both the country of Jews and Jerusalem, that they put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to those who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Verse 44, while Peter was still saying these things, the Spirit fell on those who heard the word, and the believers among them, the circumcised who had come with Peter, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was being poured out on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone hold with old water for baptizing these people, those who have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have? Then he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked, them to asked him to remain for some time. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it guides us, it leads us, it convicts us, it encourages us. Be with us as we examine it. Help us to know that this is not just a dead history book. And it's not just my opinion, Lord, but it is your word. Encourage us, Lord. Thank you for those who are here. Be with us. May my words be your words. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. That was a long, longer passage there. So first three points, if you want to take notes, um, I like to do that myself. It helps me pay attention. Um, we're looking at three points. If you do need a Bible, by the way, there are in the back there by the bathrooms as well. Peter goes to Caesarea, verses 24 through 33. Peter goes to Caesarea. Second point, Peter proclaims in Caesarea, verses 34 through 43. And thirdly, Peter sees a second Pentecost in Caesarea, verses 44 through 48. It's a big chunk, but I want to finish it up because it is a very pivotal passage. 
we kind of, you know, we did a covering of the first 10 chapters last week. It's on YouTube. If you're interested, you can look at it on the website as well. That's both the video audio there. But we can see Peter goes to Caesarea, and he doesn't know why he's going, right? He says, well, I'm sent, so I'm just going to go, but wait, why did you send for me? Right? He doesn't even know. Now, Peter doesn't know, but Cornelius does know, which is interesting. He says that there at the end of 33, which we'll get to. But the point is, God is revealing further his mystery. That it was always Gentiles, always the nations were included, but it was very foggy and, and, and just kind of vague and, and we didn't quite get it and God often is just you know probably shaking his head not really because he's omniscient but you know hey don't do this Israel and they do this and don't worship other idols and they do it anyway and don't do this and they do it anyway I mean if it were me like come on but God is more patient than me thankfully and certainly more patient than you which is great praise God right I mean he's way more patient than any human being but Israel continually fell they continually disobeyed they continually didn't do the simple things that God called them to do but we're probably not much different, really. Colossians 1.24 mentions this mystery, that this was hidden in ages to pass, but it was still there. And as we even saw all the way back to Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve, that there was this promise of the deliverer, one who was to come. But it was very vague, right? There was no Bible back then. There was no Ten Commandments. There was no Beatitudes. It was just simply there that God is going to fix this problem. We have this today. Many people... Rely on other things and not the Word. But now we have the Word. We can rely on it as a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul. So these ten men show up to Caesarea. Remember, there's three that sent, come from Cornelius. Peter, that's four. And then six leave the church gathering. They're like, hey, let's go with you. Let's road trip, right? Let's go. So they leave Joppa, which is on the coast, very beautiful area, and they go to Caesarea, which is more north. So verse 26 then shows that they're there, he enters, excuse me, back up one, verse 25, when he at least meets him, he falls down. Now this is something that, you know, might just be adoration. He might be worshiping him. Uh, it's hard to tell, really, ultimately, but, because the word can not kind of mean two different things, like, hey, I really respect you, or I'm actually worshiping you. Based on Peter's response in 26, is probably he's worshiping. And so, that's again, we need to know the context, you just can't pull out a verse and say it means this. It's the definition the thing is defined based on where it is. Right? If I say something's green or gay or lame or whatever, all those words have different definitions, don't they? You can't just say it and expect that's what's happening, or you know fully the definition. So Peter rises him up, which proves that Peter's not some demigod. Right? He's just a man, just like Cornelius. Which is interesting because Peter's a Jew, though, isn't he? And Cornelius isn't. He's a God-fearer. He's not a proselyte. He didn't convert to Judaism. He is a complete separate person. It says he's a God-fearer. And there still seems to be, you know, the jury, as it were, still out with this. He's likely not fully saved in the proper sense because we look in chapter 11 later on, uh, verse 13, that he says that you will be saved with you and your household with Peter's message. But he's still a God-fearer. And that's what's interesting, that God brings him further revelation because he's adoring and worshiping God. We see that the, the angel shows up to him earlier in chapter, right? Your alms have been forgiven, or rather remembered, before the Lord. So maybe Cornelius thinks that Peter's this guy that he sees in the vision. Maybe, it doesn't say. Or he's just saying, like, oh, I'm just going to worship you, I don't know. But I'm a man like you. So Peter's just a man. He's just a man. He's not a demigod, it's not... He's not some fictional creature or something. He's a man, just like Cornelius. Which then puts everybody on the even playing field. Which applies to us even today, right? Even if you have whatever melanin content, you're a man or a woman, wherever you're from, whether you speak English or some other language, whatever it is, we're all in this boat together. We're all human beings. And that's something that we can take courage in because the atheist, the secularist, says we're pond scum. And there's different branches of evolutionary whatever. And this doesn't work because, well, these people are less evolved. Now, they don't like to talk about this, but you go back to Darwin just a hundred or so years, and that's what he talks about. And this is where we get all this racist eugenics and all this evil wickedness that was so prevalent in the early parts of the 20th century. Well, that's not the Bible at all. Don't let the secularists tell you otherwise. <clears throat> they have a godless view of the world because it's the struggle, the survival of the fittest. We've heard that many times. But God has made from one nation every man under heaven. We see this in Acts 17. 
So though Peter is a Jew, Cornelius is not. Hey, I'm just a man, just like you. Stand up. Why am I here? What's going on? Mark 7. Flip over there for a moment. Just a couple chapters to the left there. Verse 18. And he said to them, this is Christ, talking about defilement. You, you, excuse me, and you said, and he said to them, sorry, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from without cannot defile him? Since it enters his, not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled. And he said, whatever comes out of a person is what defiles him. What comes out of the person. So there's this defilement. We don't really talk about it. You can flip back to Acts. We don't really talk about it that much in our culture about you know, shame and honor and defilement. It's still popular in many other parts of the world, not so much in America. But it is, right? You say something, and out of the overflow of your heart, your mouth speaks. Right? We see this in Luke. We see this in Matthew. It's not not saying a bad word or going to church or not going to church or not seeing this good movie or bad movie or doing these external things only. It's the same thing with righteousness, like both the wickedness and the righteousness. It's rather what's inside, right? Man looks at the outward appearance, Samuel says, but God looks at the heart. And praise God that despite him looking at the heart, because he goes on in Mark 7, that talks about adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. These are the things that defile man, because these are the things that bubble up out of our hearts, which is why we need Christ. Not this external thing only of doing these good deeds to make our heart righteous. We need the whole new heart inside. And when you come to Christ, he gives you that new heart. A heart of flesh, not of stone. Because we're born with a heart of stone. We're in this world, and it gets harder and harder. Calloused. So point of application then for us is not what we eat or not eat that makes us wicked or righteous. Right? What we do externally matters little when it's our heart is wrong. But when our heart is good and righteous because of Christ, well then that pours out differently. Motivation, if it's in your heart, praise God. But if it's not and you're trying to do these things by seeing Hey, look at these people. They're watching me. She's watching me. He's that. Oh, my parents. Oh, my, oh, my boss. Or whatever. Like, no. That shouldn't be your motivation. Just be about the Lord's work. And this is so encouraging and helpful because as we even saw with Acts chapter 1, Jesus left. He'll come back in the same way. We shouldn't be, like if we're working or at school, fooling around or children. And all the, oh, my parents, oh, you know, hey, yeah, hey, what's going on? Oh, yeah, I'm just um, working or I'm reading, yeah, I'm reading my book. You know, like, be about the Lord's work. But if you don't know Christ, of course you're not going to be about the Lord's work because you're going to do these external things to be seen by men. But the Lord knows the heart. But because he knows the heart, the encouragement, and the great thing is that because, despite your heart being so broken, he still loves you anyway in Christ. And he can take you where you are, not where you should be, but where you are. All you have to do is repent. All you have to do is surrender. Not your good deeds, not your righteousness. Bring nothing to the cross but your sin. <clears throat> Verse 30 and 32, Cornelius goes on. It says, four days ago, there's a discrepancy there, which I won't get into. It's not a big deal, so don't get worried. If yours says three days. About the, this hour, ninth hour. So ninth hour, common time, it's 3 o'clock, because the first hour is 6 a.m., goes do, 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 down to ninth hour, 3 p.m. You know, it's like quiet time, as we call it in our house, although we're not usually praying, although we probably should, but anyway. That's when Peter and John go up to the temple to pray earlier in chapter 4 of Acts, and they heal the guy. He's just there, boom, healed right away. No PT, no training, no surgery, he's just healed. So Cornelius, same thing, kind of the same habit, though, again, he's not Hebrew, he's not a Jew. An angel shows up to him. And he doesn't tell him, hey, you know, you need to clean up your life. You need to get back to church, man. But before you do, you need to give some money to your pastor, to your local congregation. Right? You need to quit eating this food. You need to stop saying those bad words. Does he say any of that? 
No. He says your alms have been remembered before God. Your prayers, alms is you know, a fancy word for just giving. Now send men to Joppa. He doesn't deserve this information, but God, as we will see, well, I'll say it. He, 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 he gives grace to Cornelius, which is something we can all deeply appreciate. Daryl Bach in his commentary on Acts says, Cornelius basically repeats the account for a third time in the passage with some slight variation. The repetition that underscores this divine direction behind him is what's taking place. The threefold telling says this definitely took place, end quote. Of course, that doesn't mean that if it only is told once, it doesn't take place or didn't take place. But what it is is saying is this thrice telling is it's very important, right? God's not just holy, but he's actually holy, 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 right? He's thrice holy. And remember, paper is not like the rings we buy at you know, Walmart or Staples or whatever, where it's just paper is in abundance. It's very, very, very rare. So when they take up the space to rewrite these things, we must take note. So this point here, this whole chapter, is this hinge, and I've said this before, in which the door, this big castle door of the gospel, the full acceptance of the gospel is swinging for the Gentiles. So it's not just the Jews only, because it was never actually ultimately for the Hebrew people, but it's being revealed as God is pulling up the drape, pulling up the curtain, and revealing that it's for everybody non-Hebrew people alike. We see this Jew and Gentile. We'll see that sometimes written in the scripture as well. Or Greek. Just shorthand for us, right? Unless you're Jewish, which probably not ethnically Jewish, although you might be. But most of us probably aren't. Note here with the white robes, as he says, there's a man shows up to me with white robes. Now, it's pointed out because White's not common. Now, I know that you look at the kids' books, and Jesus is walking around with a white robe and a sash, and he's smiling, and he's got, you know, peach-colored skin and his long hair. And it's like, probably Jesus didn't look like any of that at all. You know, not to bash on the kids' books, but we probably should need to get some better ones. Uh, because he didn't look like this, and it's just confusing. You know, you got the little bathtub and Noah's Ark, and it's like, that, the Ark was massive. What are you talking about? Like, all these things, and not to harp on that too much, but Jesus didn't wear white. Like, that's just dumb. Now, he did in his resurrection. Because he's glorified, right? And we see that in Revelation 1, for example, where he's got the burnished bronze and the eyes of fire. He's glorified Christ. This is the one who John knows personally, the, the disciple who Jesus loved, and he sees Jesus and he passes out, right? Which we all would too if we saw Christ in his glory. But this echoes chapter 1, verse 10 of Acts. Behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Mark 16, 5, after the resurrection, they saw a young man sitting at the right hand, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. Matthew 28, the same. Luke 29, 9, 29, excuse me, where Jesus is wearing, uh, he's transfigured. He goes up to the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and then they see Moses and Elijah up there too. He's transfigured. He's, his glory bursts through his humanity. It's just this, this picture, this image that this inner three guys see. Also white. But it's noted here because white isn't a common color, right? Anybody you work at, we got gardens, right? Farming and all that. And you see any farmers out there wearing all white? Anybody? No? You ever go out? Maybe, maybe you're wearing a white shirt, at least if you're a guy. If you're gonna wear jeans, your boots, if you're like me, your flip-flops, but whatever. Um, my feet dirty, I guess. We're not going out in white. And we have roads and showers and hot water and everything else. And we know better. Of course, they know better even more than we did. No one wore white. That's the whole point. So this is clearly an angelic thing. This is clearly something that is not normal, which is why it's noted here. So Cornelius sends for him as he calls for this angel. Remember the tanner, also dealing with dead bodies, also unclean. Peter's already hanging out with an unclean guy. He talks about unclean food. These other unclean guys show up. He talks to this other young, unclean Cornelius, and it's like, obviously the Lord is hitting him over the head saying, hey, everybody's included. God shows no partiality. And again, if you're taking notes, that's the title. God shows no partiality. And he doesn't. And I'm so thankful for that, and I hope that you are too. Because the alternative is, God does show partiality. 
But we just shrug our shoulders and say, I don't know what this is. I don't know who is included and who isn't. Who can actually have redemption and salvation in Christ? Who can actually be forgiven of their sin? I don't know. Maybe women. Maybe men. Maybe only these types of people. You listen to a lot of groups, a lot of people. They will tell you it's only this. I had this conversation and I won't belabor it too much, but it was an actual white supremacist who told me, this is online, that Christianity is only for white people. I was shocked, and it takes a lot to shock me. I mean, it really does, because I pay attention to stuff. And anyway, blown away. I was just blown, and I'm like, <laughs> like he was trying to tell me that Moses and Noah and Adam was white, and I'm just like, Ugh. like, I, like the ignorance was just, it was like, it was stratosphere level, like it was in the upper atmosphere of the amount of ignorance this guy had. And anyway, I share that because it's out there. It might be with somebody you work with or somebody at school. Um, but it's out there. Well, that's not what the Bible says. So that guy's lying. She's lying. Whoever's telling you that, it's wrong. But there's people that do that with all sorts of ethnicities. There's others who think that you have more melanin, you're the lost tribe of Israel. The ten tribes, they went up here. Really black people are, are the real true Israelites. Oh, wrong again. <laughs> And even if you were, you're still getting the same grace that God gives to every single person who repents. Everyone's included, but you have to repent. That's the, that's the hook. It's not this universalism everybody gets in, but rather you have to turn to Christ. That's the contingency. Second point, Peter proclaims in Caesarea, verses 34 through 43, he opened his mouth. Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. There it is again. But every nation who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. This is what I was going to say a moment ago. You have to do what is right because that tells you there's something wrong. Right? There's, there's this standard. And of course we live in this world that says that now all these things that were once, once right are now somehow wrong. And now these things are right and that's now wrong. But that's just shifting sand. That's man's opinion. That's the news, the media outlets, Hollywood. Not to belabor on the secular media too much, but they lie to us relentlessly. They don't care. They don't even believe in God, let alone wanting to worship Christ. And it's very evident. The last couple years have been very, very revealing for so many. They might give lip service, but by their actions and their de deeds, they deny Him. So Cornelius is here. Peter is proclaiming but Peter wasn't told that he was going to command, be commanded by the Lord to do these things. But Cornelius was, which is interesting, right there in verse 33. And they're here, they're eager. And I appreciate you very much as a church, that you're eager to hear the word of God. That's good. And I pray that it's not my words only, but it is the word of God. That it is him who works through my mouth. Not that I'm writing scripture and it's the same caliber, but that's the whole point in moving through a book of the Bible, is to understand what is being written, how God wrote it, and then what it means for us today. Picking and choosing only is, you know, so-so at best. Because you can avoid certain passages and jump on other passages, but it's all this kind of amalgamation of just this salad of random items that you don't really want to eat. Rather, you want to have certain salads have certain ingredients, and other salads have other ingredients, right? You don't want to put a banana and, you know, nuts and, I don't know, Caesar dressing in there. Like, that would just be gross, right? Anchovies and bananas, no thanks. So we have that, and we move through, just like you want somebody to read an email from you or a text message from you. Hey, start to finish. What does this mean? So that's why we're working through Acts why we're looking at verse by verse or trying to as best we can. So Peter opens his mouth because Cornelius says, hey, we're here. Ready, set, go. All right. So he goes through and he talks about Christ and, and moving here in verse 37. You yourselves know what happened in all Judea, beginning with Galilee, the baptism of John. So he starts with John the Baptist, the last Old Testament prophet in the spirit of Elijah. Remember the itchy camel's hair, right? He's, and he's eating bugs and honey. Proclaiming, calling people a brood of vipers. Verse 36, he tells them the good news. 
No, I just said 37. But 36, he proclaims Christ to them. And this good news, again, is what? Well, we're fallen. We're broken. We're sinners. We've all stumbled. We've all fallen short of God's glory. Every single person. We're all in this boat together. But God didn't leave us. Right? And that's the difference between pretty much every other religion. That we have to work our way in other things. Even in secularism. Now we've got to apologize. We've got to give money. We've got to get reparations. We've got to do these other things. We have to have atonement. Well, not in Christ. Not when you're a biblical Christian. When you're trusting Christ alone. That atonement, that justification comes from Him. Not our works. And praise God it doesn't come from our works. Because our works will never be enough. And that's what we're seeing crumbling around us. I don't know what's going to happen in the next five to ten years, but it's probably not going to be good. And I'm not trying to predict anything. But people continually are working on their own self-righteousness. It always fails. Every single time. But the gospel is that we are, though we're sinners, Christ sent Christ, God sent Christ into the world to save sinners. And that's what's so good. That Jesus died on that dry, splintery cross. And yes, he was killed with many thousands of other people who were also crucified. Because the Romans perfected this thing so well. Babylonians and many others did it too, but the Romans were really best at it. And yet it's only one whose blood crucified sanctifies us and washes us, makes us new. Why? Because Jesus didn't disobey his parents. He didn't disobey his boss. He didn't cheat, he didn't lie, he didn't use pornography. He didn't, he didn't lust, do anything. He didn't gossip. He was flawless. And that's why we all need Christ. That's why you need to repent and let Him wash you and then Him give you His righteousness and take away your wickedness. It's this both and. It's not just one or the other. I'm forgiven, now I can do whatever I want. Or I've got to keep earning my salvation and being good graces with Him. No. You're not saved by grace and kept by works. But because of that change in your heart, that outflows and works towards other people, towards your family, towards your church body. You do these out of love, not obligation. And that's the difference. And that's the gospel. Christ saves sinners, unworthy sinners, mind you. Lazy people. Drunk people, liars, cheats, fornicators, adulterers, right? All of them. But praise God he does, because we're all in that boat together. I'm not condemning anybody and saying you're worse than her or he's worse than you. No, we're all falling short of God's glory. And yet, just like the angel that shows up to Cornelius, he doesn't tell him all these other things you have to do, this laundry list. Just send for Peter. He's hanging out on the ocean right by the beach there. He'll come, and he'll teach you. He'll talk more about what you need to know, Cornelius. And he does. And we see that in Acts 11, next chapter, we'll probably look at next week. And he told, verse 13, us how he had, to, had seen an angel stand in the house and say, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. And he will, here it is, declare the message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. So this saved here, you know, again, isn't just a temporal, though it can mean that. But the context here is likely salvation. We see this from Acts 2.47, and especially Acts 4.12. There's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. The authorial context, remember that's another book that the author wrote. You use that same word, not the near context, but the authorial context. So move to another book, which, of course, Luke wrote Luke. 19.10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the loss. Not just for now, right? This, a lot of people, liberal Christians, progressive Christians, they talk about Jesus and this stuff now. Now that's good, right? Feeding the poor, giving water. Sometimes we've got this pendulum swing of just, you know, go back and forth, one or the other. No, we should feed the poor and also proclaim truth to them and say, you're a sinner, you need to repent. Here's a meal, right? James says, be warm and filled, but don't actually do anything? Well, that's dumb. How's that going to help anybody? You thirsty? Oh, man. Well, you know, Jesus died for your sin. You're almost going to die of thirst. i got a bunch of water here, but I'm not going to give it to you. You should just repent, though. No, give them the water, satisfy that physical need, and then satisfy the spiritual need. Both and. Both and. So sometimes that saving means that, oh, hunger, right? Thirst. 
clothing exposure. We don't really see much of this because we're very wealthy in our current moment. You know, we've got AC, we've got electricity, everything. But many people are very exposed, even in our world today. They don't know where they're going to sleep, or they sleep in some sort of makeshift thing. They don't have any trust that that's going to hold up. Robbers and animals and so on easily can come in. So count your blessings. Be thankful. Don't be, you know, feel bad if you have opulence, that we have opulence. This is where the Lord has placed us. But at the same time, don't brag about it or be envious of others for it. But this is what the gospel does. It changes our hearts. It takes out the stony flesh, stony heart, and gives us a fleshy one. Verse 36 and 37, he gives us that peace. I was talking earlier with somebody and he was saying how often he didn't have peace. He hated his sin and he felt like God hated him. And there's no peace. There's this restlessness. But Christ gives peace. It's the shalom. If you've heard that, it's probably the most famous Hebrew word. And that's what it's just translated there in Hebrew. Shalom. It's peace. It also means hello. If you go to Israel today, somebody would say shalom to you. We see this all over the Bible. Psalm 2911 is 1. 2911, Proverbs 3, 17. Isaiah 48 and 54, and many, many other places too. Because Christ was the one who was to come, right? The Old Testament speaks of him. We see how there's this prediction, the prophets, and it says later on, the whole prophets speak of him. This peace gives a good relationship between you and God, between you and the Creator. The question is, do you have this peace? Do you have this peace? Ephesians 2, 11 and 12 speaks about Jew and Gentile being reconciled. But really, it's between humans, fallen, broken, sinful humans, and a holy, righteous, omnipotent God. That's where the reconciliation comes from. People will abuse this passage again in our modern time and say it's between you know, black people and white people, this ethnicity and that, this group and that group. Well, that happens only when you actually come to Christ. Full reconciliation, you understand, man, you've sinned against me, I've sinned against you, but... By golly, we've sinned against God way more. <laughs> so your sin, it's not that big of a deal. Really, ultimately. Though it might be a quote-unquote big deal. I'm not saying we don't have criminal justice or anything like that. I'm just saying that the point is, when we understand where we are in relation to God, when we sin against each other, it's kind of like dust. It's just real small stuff. So this is accomplished by our good deeds, isn't it? Right? Yes. No, Debbie. No, it's not accomplished by our good deeds. I must have tricked you, sorry. Sorry. Giving to the poor, right? It's not that. No, I'm just kidding. We'll cut that out. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Going to church, right? Giving money. All these things, these are good things, but this righteousness, this peace that comes from Christ, isn't accomplished by those outward deeds. It's not. It's only through Christ, his life, his death, and his resurrection. But that's what's so good about it. Because we don't bring anything to the table. Because if we did, we would never know what's enough. We'd say, well, I mean, I've got this. And I mean, I've got, I mean, this is expensive. i got my phone. And do you want some water? And you pour it on the altar. And you're like, do we need, is he, is he accepting it? I mean, this, the whole history is strewn throughout this craziness. I mean, there's all sorts of, we need to get into it probably at some point. But. The wickedness of the Canaanites and, and the Amorites and their child sacrifice and how they would throw in live people alive in tied up into the waters. And if the, the body came out bloody, it wasn't accepted. But if it didn't and it disappeared, it was. And it's like, what? Like, that's crazy. And yet we are like, well, you know, how could one guy take the atonement for the whole world? Well, he can't because he's God. That's the difference. He can because he's God. And because God did it, not humans. That's the difference. And because ultimately, the shedding of blood is required for sin. That's what the scripture says. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So we need shed blood. The question is, who shed blood? Because what's the alternative? You're thinking, oh, I don't know, though. that's kind of weird. That's gross. Well, what's the alternative then? How are you going to be righteous? How are you going to make yourself good enough for God? Write it down, put it in the envelope. Let me know. You can't. That's right. I won't, I won't, I won't hold my breath. Thanks, Dad. 
Don't hold my breath. But the point is that the Gentiles are being included, right? There is no partiality with the Lord. It wasn't because the Jewish people were so good, right? We see this. They're not big in number and everything else, and they continually fall on their faces. But we continually fall on our face too, don't we? We continually stub our toe and have problem after problem. But praise God, He is the one who changes us, renews us, and has a relationship with us that calls us to walk in that newness of life. So Peter here, verse 38 through 41, is teaching. He's talking about what happened, who oppressed by the devil. Jesus is doing good. This doing good is just, again, that kind of tangible thing, feeding people, healing people. This is spoken of of other people in the Greek writers here. We see talking about Hercules, Ptolemy, uh, Socrates, Euripides, and others. Not that Jesus was some philosopher guy only, though he was a very good philosopher, but he's also God. But he's also man, right? Sometimes we get so stuck in, well, he's God, but he's also man. Sometimes, you know, the left side of the spectrum will be like, well, he was just a, he's a good moral teacher. He wasn't God. He's both, right? And we need to hold those in tension, and though we might not fully get it, that's what the text says. He talks about being before Abraham, who lived 2,000 years ago. And the guys then want to kill him, the Pharisees. We don't want to kill somebody when you just make an off-the-cuff statement. But if you say you're God, well, then you're obeying the law, which says, hey, I'm God, all right, we're going to stone you now, because ain't nobody God but God. Well, it doesn't work with Jesus, because he was God. And yet he was hung on a tree for it. Didn't catch God off guard, the Father. He sent Jesus into the world. Acts 5.30, Galatians 3.13, Deuteronomy 21.22, all talks about people being hung on a tree and cursed. So you're like, well, hold on. So Jesus was cursed? Yes. He was cursed for your sin, for mine, for our rebellion. God saw our sin, past, present, and future, and every single person who repents and turns to Christ on the tree. Not in a tree, not hung like the Jehovah Witnesses say. He's actually on probably a post, and there's a cross beam, and they hence make the cross. He would drag the cross beam. I know we see the movies, it's a full cross. 99% sure it wasn't a full cross when he's dragging it through Jerusalem streets. The point is he died. He was cursed. He was crushed for our iniquities. By his wounds, the KJV says his stripes, the whipping, the bloodshed, we are healed. That's it. There's nothing else better than that, church. There isn't anything better. How else are you going to be healed by your own wickedness or from your own wickedness? How? Anybody know? Anybody ever talk to anybody online, Facebook, Twitter? Go out there. You're on your blogs talking to these people. They've got nothing. There is zero, less than zero. There is no forgiveness in the world. No redemption apart from Christ. None. Don't look anywhere else. If you're still not sure, repent and turn to Christ and let Him change you. Let Him wash you and make you new. It is so much better. Turn over to 1 Peter 1, or 1 Peter 2, excuse me, 24. We'll close out with this. First Peter 2.24. So when he was reviled, he did not, 23, back up, reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, this is Jesus, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Listen to this. Let this sink in. Mark it. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Why? Why would he do this? That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, we are healed. And despite that, I've got to keep going. 25, you are all like sheep straying, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. By his wounds. So that we will die to our sin. We'll crucify the flesh. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by glory in the Son of God. 
This is why Christ came. This is why Christ died. This is why Christ resurrected and ascended. This is the reason for Jesus. Not just your moral example, not a good guy, not some philosopher teacher, not to just heal people. He wasn't just a misunderstood prophet. No. His wounds makes us whole. So that we will die to sin and live to righteousness. This was part of my own testimony. Thinking I had to be good enough for God. I had to do enough righteous things. Do the Ten Commandments. And I didn't know what they were. <clears throat> I do now, thankfully, preaching through them. I hope I remember them. But, you know, whatever. I could forget, I guess. But the point is, you can't. You can't do it. By the works of the law, no flesh is justified. It doesn't say some flesh is justified, or most flesh, or only women's flesh is justified, or only men's flesh is justified, or this people group, or these people who speak English. No flesh. It's so binary, so cut and dry. But in our world of constant chaos, they hate this, but they have no foundation. They're standing literally on jello. Or as one theologian said, firmly planted in midair are their feet. They've got no foundation. There's nothing. And this isn't to insult people. This is to reveal you to you and say, listen, there is an answer. It's not meaningless. It's not chaos. It's not nonsense. Quite the contrary. If you don't know Christ, you can know Christ. Similarly, if you were to get an envelope in the mail and realize, hey, I've got this handwritten thing, I've got the coupons I'll never use, and this bill and that bill, but there's this handwritten note. You open it up and you realize what's, who this is, and oh, I don't, you don't know who, who this is, and it's your long-lost uncle. And you're like, I don't know. My mom mentioned this half-brother. You read on and you realize this guy is talking about this thousand-acre cattle ranch in Montana and this mountain house in Colorado and this beach house in Florida, and he wants to give these things to you. And he says, I have no children. I want to make you, you're my only heir. I want to bless you and give these things to you. What do you do? Right? You think, oh, this is just, this, I don't know who, you know, Frank is, Uncle Frank. I don't, maybe I guess I'll call my mom and see, but this doesn't sound right at all. This sounds too good to be true, right? But then you're like, well, maybe I'll just wait. But if you wait, that's still a no, right? If you hesitate between two opinions, eventually it's going to be a no. And it'll probably go to the government. No one wants that. So you call, right? And you figure it out. And you realize this is an uncle, but you had to do something. You had to accept it. Do you deserve the cattle ranch or the house on, in Florida? The likely tens of millions of dollars that's going to radically change your life? No, you don't deserve it at all. Not at all. But he wants to bless you. And God, exponentially more, and this is where the illustration falls apart, is God not only blesses us now, and like Paul says in Philippians 4, I learned to be content with much and with little. Opulence, right? We've got lots of stuff here. Lots of food, covering, we all got nice clean clothes on. Be thankful for that. I really, I really mean that. I really do. But if somehow destitution comes to you, Learn to be content with that too. But you have to contact your uncle, right? You have to repent and turn to Christ if you have not. If you don't know and you're not walking in the riches that Christ offers, turn to Him. There's nothing you're going to do that's going to make you better than you were. This is what I thought when I was in my BC days. I had to be a better person later on. God would like me more at some point when I'm older. Don't wait until you're done with college or done with children. Or when you retire, or I have more time. <coughs> I love the song, I love it. I don't think we're singing it, but if you tarry, if you wait till you're better, you're never going to come. You never will come, and you won't. One commentator says, Jesus Christ is the inescapable one. You must either receive him in this life as our loving Savior, or stand before him in life to come as the eternal judge. Lastly, very quickly, third point. We can see that the Holy Spirit falls, and this is where the second Pentecost comes. This is kind of echoing chapter 2. And again, they're still confused. People are there. The Jewish are like, really? Wait, what's going on? 
It doesn't speak about languages, but they're just extolling God. Doesn't mean too weird, but they're speaking in tongues and extolling God. Okay, that's what it says. Peter declared, can anyone withhold from water from baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? This is where the door is swung wide open. And the floodgates of the gospel being poured out to every single man, woman, boy, and girl, Jew or Gentile, is fully coming forth. Peter, of course, asked a rhetorical question, can anybody hold with a water? No, of course not. Let's do it. We are creatures who are responsible to our Creator. And this Creator who has revealed Himself in Christ in the former days spoke to us by the fathers and the prophets, but in these now current last days spoken to us by His Son. Remember, every, everyone is a worshiper. Either worshiping God or something else. So three things. God shows no partiality. Number one. God shows no partiality. Salvation is for everyone. Doesn't mean everyone's saved, right? You have to call your uncle. Right? You have to say, uh, yeah, tell me more about this. What's going on? You don't know all the answers. If you don't know Christ, don't think, well, I don't know all these answers and all the Bible stuff. I'll look like an idiot. Yeah, great. Join the club. Don't think you know all the answers. It's called sanctification. You're being refined and renewed and walking. It's the Christian walk, not the Christian sit. Second point, God desires relationship with us. But if you remain in your sin, you're lost. You're going to get what you want in this life, but you get it for eternity, which is condemnation, which is death. And lastly, if you know Christ, you walk in that newness of life He provides. Being about the Lord's work, just as He left in Acts 1, we know He'll come back one day. And that is, I'm not making any predictions. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this morning. Thank You for these people's patience. I pray, God, that your word is strengthening us, encouraging us, convicting us, moving us. Anyone who doesn't know you can come. Come talk to me. But ultimately, they need to talk to you. They need to repent. They need to surrender, raising the white flag and giving up their claim on their life. God, thank you that the Gentiles are included. Thank you for this account of Cornelius and this, this long, very detailed story that Peter, you use, moved, and, and constantly was probably shaking his head or scratching his head and wondering what would happen next with the vision and the people being included, and yet he went in faith. May we go in faith. May we trust you, Lord. Not requiring an angel because we have accounts of angels here. These are your words telling of us, telling us of these things. So we don't need an angel. It'd be fun, sure, that'd be nice, but we don't require that, Lord. May we not crave these things, but learn from what you have already said. Be with us now, Lord. Thank you for this time. In Christ's name.